are here today to honor you, to, in spite of what our culture is teaching you, let you know that what you're doing is indispensable, is unbelievably important, is central to the well-being of our family, of our kids, of our culture. We want to celebrate that. And I do just want to say, before we dive in here, we also want to acknowledge anybody who's carrying some dad pain. I mean, being in a situation where dad wasn't present or he wasn't all that he should be, or you're trying to make sense of that, we just want to acknowledge that pain and call it out and just come back to the incredible gift we have and God being our father. But this weekend, I really do want to talk to the dads, and I just want to say, dads, you have an incredible job, and and your job is to prepare your kids for their grand adventure that your kids were created to do something with and for God that will fill their lives with meaning. And so this weekend, what we're talking about is this thing of our sons and our daughters were created for a grand adventure. And you are either setting them up for that, or you are actually making that grand adventure harder to achieve, harder to find, And it's actually something that people can miss. So what we really want you to understand, and this is the bottom line, that a father's love, and a father's love can look different even than a mom's love. A father's love prepares a child for a life of adventure, passion, compassion, and resilience and freedom. And and, and so this weekend, I want to just just highlight a principle that really has been one of the foundational principles that has guided me as a father, one that I, I kind of found late for some of my early kids. I always feel bad for the early kids, right? I'm the youngest, you know, they waited till perfection arrived and then they quit. So, so, but the older kids, experiment kids, you know, that kind of thing. Um, um, but, but, but the bottom line is that a father has a role. And this is the principle, understanding the right balance between protection and preparation protection and preparation. Because if we overprotect, they won't be prepared. If we underprepare, they won't be protected. Because the best protection ultimately for your sons and daughters is preparation. For them to be ready for the great adventure that they are called to. Now this is a little chart that we created to kind of illustrate this. So, so this is the protection preparation chart. So this is, down here is when we have low, low, um, um, pr- low preparation and high protection. So this is this, is this chart. And, and here's the deal. When we have babies, we receive these babies like half-formed. And, and initially, the, the, these are little tyrants, right? These are little, like, just little people who just, whatever they want, whatever they need, we arrange our life for it, we spend money on it, we spend time on it. They demand a huge amount of protection. It's very high. And you don't do a lot of preparation. You don't go to a newborn baby and say, what are your long-term plans? Where do you see yourself in five years? You know, you don't have that conversation right away unless you need help. You don't have that conversation, right? (laughs) But as they get older, and this is such a key, is the older they get, the more your emphasis needs to be on preparation and the less it needs to be on protection. Because ultimately, High preparation leads to life protection. And, and here's, the, here's the secret of what just drives preparation, okay? Are you ready? Let them do it. Let them, the minute they can do it, let them do it. Expect them to do it. Listen, they want to do it. How many of you have had kids have had something where your kid was doing something and they weren't doing it right and you were trying to do it for it and they said something like with incredible frustration, let me do it. I can do it. I'm big now. I can do this thing. There's this natural desire in a child to do it for themselves. And listen, when we take it out of their hands, we think we're protecting them. We think we're making it easy. But what we're actually communicating to them is, I don't think you can handle this. And the older they get, and the more we do this, particularly in those teen years, when we do everything from tie their shoes to clean their rooms to get them out of trouble to dealing with a bully to all those kinds of things, the more we do it for them, the more we are undermining their confidence and actually teaching them to fear life and filling them with anxiety because we're saying to them, you know, Anything hard, anything difficult, anything confusing, anything you struggle with, I'm going to take away from you because I want to protect you. And the truth is, at a certain point, 
We are no longer protecting them. We are protecting ourselves. Because the thought of watching them hurt is just too much. And so it, at some point, becomes about us and not about them. The other thing is that we find that particularly in these teen years, it's just hard. It's just hard because you want them to be doing a lot of trying when they're with you because there's no place safer for them to try than with you because if they mess up, you're there. You want them making big mistakes when they're with you. You want an environment where mistakes are tolerated, are expected, even at times celebrated because that's the place where you want them to try and not be good. Because it, just about everything in life, when you try something at first, you're not good at that. Whether that be humor, or relationships, or dating, or driving, or whatever it is. And this middle part is particularly difficult. This is particularly true with preteens. Because here's one of the keys. When you're here, they're babies you're doing for them. In this middle section, you're doing with them. And that is the most frustrating thing. Because you can do it better already. It'll be quicker and easier if you did it. And if your goal is to simply, you know, get the job done, then you should probably do it. But if your goal is to raise someone who is prepared, you should go through the difficult of making it with them, mowing the lawn with them, taking the trip with them, showing them, coaching them up, and just, it's so frustrating. You're just doing it wrong. Why are they still doing it wrong? Because they're new. Okay, and so this is the hardest part. And then you get to this really difficult hard part where they're adults, where pretty much all you can do is watch and pray. And so this thing of protection and preparation is everything. And I'll illustrate this in two ways. This is the cutest grandchild ever made. <laughs> Case closed, okay. <laughs> this picture right here inspires me, delights me, and terrifies me because I know her mother. I know her mother. I know what this thing is capable of. The DNA is strong in this one. And there's something about this look that says, you have no idea. But this child is, is created for adventure. Something that's going to require her to struggle and to hurt and to try and to fail and be rejected and be disappointed and be frustrated. And that is exactly what we should want. That she would care about something at such a deep level that she would give the best parts of herself for that thing. That is a life of meaning and significance and joy. And I don't know what that is. Now, right now, it's all protection, okay? The biggest fear we have for this child right now is she'll get a mosquito bite, you know? And so we protect her, and we have all, and that's exactly the way it should be. But more and more, listen, from the minute a baby picks up their head, they are asserting their independence. They're moving away from you. You say, I'm losing them. You are, and you should. Because it's their journey, it's their thing. And so protection and preparation. Now, now understand this from the scripture. What does a father's love do? It gives courage for adventure. The Bible says that our children are like arrows in a quiver. We shoot them, and they go places we cannot go. In order to do that, they've got to have courage. They also need to have passion for a cause. This wonderful verse that says, For you know that we deal with one another as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging them to live lives worthy of the calling of God. This is one of the big mistakes we, we make in our culture. We say to kids, what do you want to do with your life? What do you, what, what's interest you? What's your passion? No, no, no. The central question is, what did God create you to be and do? For what purpose bigger than yourself? Because if you live your life and your journey the way you want it for yourself, it's not fulfilling. But if you find that thing that you were created, whether it be numbers or people or a task or, or thinking or, or whatever it is, when you find that, life becomes deeply meaningful when you learn how to serve beyond yourself. A father teaches compassion for the weak. Shu already mentioned the story of the, 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 the prodigal son. And when that son came home, he received mercy and a second chance and another chance and a believable compassion for those who are weak and broken. And when our kids see that in us, they experience that. And, and, and they experience a resilience for a struggle. And, and what that looks like is just understanding that, that when we discipline our children, 
That is to say, and discipline very often looks very tender, where we help them see they were off and help them get back on. When we require them to manage themselves, manage their negative emotions, manage their actions, manage their relationships in a way that they understand that ultimately they are responsible for their life, their education, their selves. The more we can do that, the more we equip them. And then we could talk about the, 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 the gift a father gives self-control for freedom. That is to say, when a father helps a child get on the right path, a Establish patterns, they learn self-control. And here's what's important about self-control. Self-control often feels like we're restricting our freedom. But when you have self-control, you actually open the door to freedom because you're not controlled by your passions and your desires and all the things that, that, that would keep you from being free. What, what freedom is is not freedom to do whatever you want. Freedom is freedom and power to live up to your responsibilities and, and live your life well. And if you're controlled by things because you don't have lack of control, lack of self-control, you actually find yourself not prepared for life. So here's just the big principle. Properly discipline your children so that they may learn to discipline themselves. Okay? Now, I went through this kind of quick because we're going to kind of unpack some of it in this next example of what I'm talking about. So what we're going to do is I'm going to actually invite my son Ben out, and he's going to talk to us about a grand adventure that he was on this last summer. So we welcome my son Ben. This is Ben. Hello, Ben. Welcome. Hello. Why don't you tell us about the adventure you had last summer? Yeah, the past summer I went on a canoe trip that started in Ely, Minnesota. That's the northernmost part of Minnesota, over down at the bottom of the map here. And it ended at the Arctic Ocean, uh, specifically Hudson Bay. And the trip took us, me and one other person, 84 days. It was about 1,300 miles and had over 100 portages where we had to unload our boat and carry it on land around obstacles. So other than tormenting your mother, why did you do this trip? <laughs> so that, uh, when I was living in Ely, and Ely is the canoe capital of the world, and I just was kind of gripped by the idea that even just the water, like the lakes and the rivers can be a path to exploration and I had a lot of mentors who did similar trips and it just like ignited something in me where I want to see if I can do this. Yeah. So something was like a call because you were a little obsessed about this yeah. for like seven years. Yeah, it was seven years of planning. Yeah, it was and you worked on it. So um, what kind of preparation went into this in terms of you being prepared because you didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, let's drive to Ely, get in a coup and float to the Arctic Ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what kind of preparation are you talking about? So I think the preparation started when I was very, very young. I think this path was laid out for me to go on the journey. And that included, you know, fishing when I was really little, like just seeing what kind of animals are out there, walking off the trails at the creek behind our house, because there were a lot of times we had to walk off the trails to figure out a path, because there wasn't, we're so remote, there weren't paths in a lot of areas. And just traveling with other people in Ely through different summer camps and kind of just following that search for challenge and discomfort, like yeah. lean in when something was hard. Just being curious outside. You were a scout, and I remember one time you took a wilderness survival course. You were like 12. Tell us about that. Yeah, and that was scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Because it was just... And I didn't want you to do it. You didn't. And you've talked about this in other messages before. Where, but my side of the story is I was scared. I had had a tarp and like a sleeping bag out there with me. Yeah, but you were at the, the scout camp. You were in no danger. Yeah, like uh. that was a mile from the nearest building. Right. And there were staff there, so it was safe. But had that scary discomfort going on, and I wanted to quit. Right. And luckily I didn't. Uh, There's this huge thunderstorm but I stayed dry anyway, and I was able to walk back with a super wet tarp. Yeah, before but the storm, I walked out there to say, hey, Ben, you okay? And I remember you being angry with me. Mm -hmm. Like, no, get lost. Let me do this. <laughs> You're embarrassing me in front of the other scouts kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. But I do remember you walking back into camp that next morning, because you were the youngest scout we had, like, in the troop, and no one else had done that, and you were, like, different. You were like, <laughs> I'm Ben. Deal with it, people. You know, he's just, just uh -huh. a bold guy. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. Very cool. So what lessons did you learn about yourself and what did you learn about people in this, on this trip? 
Yeah, definitely learn more about God. Yep. And something I learned about myself was I learned a lot. Like, if, well, you, you generate what you focus on. Right. So in situations where it is really hard and kept positive and focused on what the next step was going to be, we would do a lot better. Yeah. But it, when fear came in, we started yeah. focusing on the thing that I was afraid of, that's when things would get more hairy, like yeah. focusing on the waves instead of getting through the waves kind of thing. So how did it affect the dynamic with your partner, who you were with a long time? Yeah, so this is another interesting thing that we learned about fear. We were sitting on this beach, and it was so windy we couldn't go anywhere for three days. Yeah. We were just wow. me, this guy, and the sand. Yeah, wow. <laughs> and he asked me, has this trip been everything you wanted it to be? And I told him, no, this has been... Well, yes and no, but it's been way harder than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. So much harder. Every yeah. step of the way, every portage, every rapid, everything. And he said, Ben, I've been waiting for you to say that. Yeah. Because I've been scared. And I, I was trying to hold it together to, like, be a good teammate and be supportive yeah. and not be scared. But he was thinking, why isn't Ben scared? Yeah. So our fears were feeding each other's and we're in a cycle. Yeah. So what were the hardest things you faced on there, this trip? So three of the largest physical challenges we had was Lake Winnipeg, and, we'll, and that's a uh, large lake along the way. It took yep. us about two weeks to get up. Yep. And then we had a three-day portage through a swamp. Yep. We had to cut our path through. Yeah. So we didn't really paddle much water for three days. Right. And we had a 10-mile stretch of river in a canyon that had rapids in it. So we had to figure out how we're going to navigate that stretch. You didn't mention any of this to your mom when you were planning the trip, I noticed. <laughs> Let, let's look at some of the pictures. So this was at uh, a great part of the trip. Yeah. So Blood Vein River, great time, great fishing. And then this is uh, one of the portages. And you didn't find this path, you cut this path. It just, there, there was no path. So left and right of me in that picture, that shows uh, what it looked like before we showed up. So we had to walk the path first to scout it use axe and saws to cut a path back, and then do two trips to carry all our backpacks and canoe across the trail. Yeah, huge portages. So this doesn't look like there's a lake or a canoe, a river anywhere in this one. No, you're, normally the canoe trips include some form of water. Usually they we do that. For, so. We took a break and did a three-day hiking trip. Uh, you did. So, uh, so like, all right, so just put in perspective, this is Lake Winnipeg. Tell us about this. Yeah, so on the far side for me, that's Wisconsin, and the blue body of water... Closer to me, that's Lake Winnipeg. Lake Winnipeg, this is the same scale. So Lake Winnipeg is approximately one Wisconsin long. <laughs> <laughs> and the blue line is where we entered the lake. So we came in at the hardest part of the lake. And it's an especially dangerous lake because of how shallow it is. You can be a mile out and hit a rock, but you still have that large surface area to generate wind. So waves come up quickly and easily, and they're large, and they stay for a long time. So it was, uh, and you yeah. can't, so you can't paddle close to shore and, and either. And there's no people on this lake. This no. is, there's a deserted lake. So you, how, how many days were you on this lake? Uh, two weeks. So it's 14 days. Yeah, and so you got trapped there several days. Yeah, we probably had six of those days where we couldn't move at all, and then many more of those days we could only travel half a day. Or, running out of food. Yeah, running out of food too. Yeah. So it was either stressful because we were, traveling and it was scary or we weren't traveling and we we're running out of food yeah so let's take a look at a little bit of time on lake winnipeg this is our beach camp we made up here camp ten pods right there you can barely see back in the woods that's where our kitchen and tarp is set up is gets you a little bit out of the wind and then uh, around. Working on staying patient. I heard you saying that, working on staying patient. Uh, so, uh, I guess so, right? Oh, so there were a lot of things that were dangerous and scary and crazy, but there are a lot of good things too. So let me ask you this question. What did you learn about God from this whole experience? Yeah, so I think that calling for me to go on this trip was put in my heart, because like you were talking about, it was almost like an obsessive thought, like, right. yeah, I don't know if I'm going to do this, but we gave it a shot, and 
we had to walk that path. Yeah. And he put some things in that path that were pretty hard, you know, the waterfalls, this lake, but all those challenges brought me closer to him. Yeah. And we're going to go over some of the good times. Yeah, there. some of the good times. Here, you're going to go to the next one. So this was at that same campsite. That's the exact same campsite that the waves were blowing. So those hardest moments were put right next to the best moments. Yeah. So the ju juxtaposition of feeling lonely, scared, and afraid, and frustrated on Lake Winnipeg was put next to us finishing it and getting to town. Yes. And the town at the end where we pick up more food, it's called Norway House, and everyone in the town showed up to help us. Yeah. As soon as they figured out we paddled there, they said, what do you need? We'll give you food, rides around town. Here's where the post office is where you can get your food. Uh, showers. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and this picture is the best one of the trip. And there's no canoe in this picture. There's no rapids. It looks like you could have been in the backyard. Yeah. And the family that were, owns this trampoline, uh, the Albertson family, they took us in. And they let us stay with them. And fed us. And the, the dad, he actually went on a trip paddling to Hudson Bay also. So mm -hmm. he got to be a part of our journey, which is really cool. Uh, but those really hard times of feeling alone next to feeling just like overwhelmed with love, that s sort of gave me like the emotional buy-in to Jesus and Christianity. Mm -hmm. Like I had like a cognitive case already made for it. Right. But I felt it. The yeah, relationship was there. You've been on the, the journey of saying, okay, does it make intellectual sense? There is a God. Yeah. And then is this Jesus? Yeah, that makes sense. And it was in your head. But it got your heart on this. Yeah, and this was specifically, this journey was designed specifically for me to walk with him and figure that out. That's very cool. So uh, tell us about some of these other good times. What's going on here? So the, yeah, so that big pile of rapids, that's the canyon with, on the river with 10 miles of rapids. We walked around this section, but we almost quit there. But we decided, okay, we're going to try again tomorrow and see if we're actually going to be brave enough to do this. And there was a path through those rapids. And we ran most of them just from a quick look in the boat. So we're like just floating through them, never, pa never going to paddle them again, never paddled them before. Yeah. And the canyon was never on both sides of the river. Yeah. So we actually could have gotten off at any point if we wanted to. Yeah. And then uh, that next day you found this place. Yeah. If we had quit and got a boat pickup that day, we wouldn't have seen this waterfall. So no one paddles this river. Almost no one goes up this creek to so go see that So almost no one in the history of history has seen that place mm -hmm. but you. And it's going to be different next year because the rocks are eroding. So we're the only ones that got to see it yeah. looking like that. And then your trip ended on the Arctic Ocean. Yeah. So you went swimming in the Arctic Ocean. You have to. You, you have to. Yeah, really, I mean, at <laughs> that point, that really is. And you went from, like, loons to polar bears. Mm -hmm. So you were in country with beluga whales and polar bears and northern lights and crazy. This picture always bothered me a little bit because uh, you see the sign that clearly says polar bears don't walk in this area as you are walking in this area. So <laughs> They have those hanging up all over town. Yeah, well, that's <laughs> because you did indeed uh, find the polar bears then. So this is... They eat people. They eat only meat. They eat only meat. Yeah, you'd be a McNugget for one of these <laughs> uh, things. So, And then, um, again, you see, if you can see way far in the distance, um, that little white dot is indeed a polar bear, and there's whales all around and all these kinds of things like that. So um, um, what are you going to do with this experience? Yeah, so when I first got back from that trip, uh, I'd been working in wilderness therapy, and... I've been doing that for four years, and that's working with preteens and adolescents who had developmental trauma. And we're talking about, like, some of the most hurt people in the country. Yeah. And we, they literally went on a journey, like a backpack expedition, kind of like what I did. Yeah. And you almost think, like, oh, they can't do it. Like, a lot of them, their parents have been like, you can't, they, there's no way they can do this. And they just come out different people. Like, yeah. I actually believe you can do this, and I'm yeah. going to help you. I'm going to walk with you as you do it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So what are you going to do next? I'm working with Venture Academy now. Okay. I'm going to be an outdoor education specialist with them, and I'm really excited to bring 
sort of this style of learning to the Chippewa Valley. Yeah. And it doesn't nece it's not necessarily going to look like an eight-month canoe trip with kindergartners. To the Arctic Circle. But you can third grade, I think can, they need to be at least in third grade before we go Arctic Circle. You can teach in that kind of space, though, where you figure out what their comfort zone is and what's going to stretch them and give them a reason to take on a journey. Yeah. Like, you can teach that to anybody. Ropes, rock climbing, canoeing, all that kind of stuff, as well as just being in nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very, very cool. Very good. So what advice would you give to dads? Yeah, I was thinking about this. So it made me have a question of what's the best way to keep our loved ones safe and manage their path so that it's at the best ending for them. And the answer to that is we can't. There are too many factors that we can't control. And then even the ones we can control, like how much control do we really have over them? So I think it ultimately takes trust in Jesus that he does have a path laid out that we can't understand and that we can't control. And that's kind of like an uncomfy, scary answer to say mm -hmm. you actually don't as much control as you're trying to have. Right. But it's also a load off. Like, right. Someone, like, it will be hard, but there is someone who can see him through it. And right. You just got to stay pointing in the right direction. Yeah. That's a good word, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate you. Let me say thank you for Ben coming and sharing just a little bit of a story. Yeah. Thanks. Love you, buddy. Love you, too. Proud of you. Thanks. <clears throat> Well, there are about a thousand more lessons and so many more stories. Ben's going to be in the, the back after service today. Um, but there's just so much there. As we've talked about lessons he learned on that journey that now he's going to be able to share and live. Uh, we've gone through a hard day a while back, and we were talking on the phone, and the response was, uh, how was your day? Hard. Wasn't as hard as that day in Winnipeg, though. And so... Um, <laughs> It, it, it makes you different. When you saw him at the end, he was skinnier, his beard was longer, but he was a different man. He had become a different man. It's absolutely stunning and inspiring. Just a beautiful, beautiful thing. And, and that's so much of it. This dad is why you don't want to rob your child of the dignity of their struggle. Because the most important thing that Ben said in all of this, and I see it in him, and is that he's become a man of profound faith through this, that he found God in the struggle. So why would you want to rob your kids of the struggle? Because very often, he and I have been talking about the ideas and the philosophies and the reasons to believe in God and Jesus, and he got it, and it was there. But when you're out there, as he would say on Lake Winnipeg, and your canoe is slamming, you're not sure you're going to get to ground, you're hoping Jesus walks on the water, and then God provides for you, and you feel his tenderness and his love and a holy fear, God becomes very personally real we find God in the struggle. Um, it was a pretty cool thing. And as a parent, the older they get, the more you're supposed to pray for and watch that struggle. Trust God and trust the preparation you've been given. And so uh, that was a little bit of our summer last summer. It was actually a very stressful summer for my wife and I because they were in places where they were hundreds of miles away from any road. So if they needed anything, how would we know? How would we get there? Can you rent a helicopter? How does that even work? It's Canada. Do they, I, what's going on here? And so every day they had this GPS. They didn't have a phone. where they just hit a button and a satellite went up to the satellite and it would say just this little message every day, trip on schedule, we are fine, basically. And then the location that they hit that button. Once a day they would do that. And that's what we had for like three months. We got a couple phone calls when they got to these remote fly-in towns. There are no roads. Even the town he talks about, there are no roads to get to those towns. You have to get there by water or by seaplane. And so they're there. One of these, he went to one lake where there was a, uh, a fly-in only fishing encampment. And uh, the only way to get there is fly-in. They roll in a canoe. <laughs> and so the guy's like, how did you get here? Uh, we, we floated. Just that's not possible. Well, here we are. And so um, just story after story like that. But every day, you know, I, I, I'm a map guy, and so every day I had my maps out, and I was looking. And I said, okay, they made good progress. Oh, there's rapids tomorrow. I wonder if they're ready for that. He's more ready than I am. Okay, it's all good. And I prayed for him constantly and just saw him and so proud of him and so afraid for him. Wanted to go get him and his mom. Oh, man. And so all this stuff, we just every day, you just had to trust God. You just have to trust God. You just have to trust God. And, and you'd see those days on Winnipeg, they haven't moved for three days. I hope everything's okay. Get that message. We're okay. I guess they're okay. And all you can do is pray. And so at one point in this uh, journey, um, one of the things they were hoping to get was um, um, letters. And in the first location, they didn't get their, their letters. They didn't get there in time. So they called from that location. It had been very high. Our ben was really emotional. We were talking to him. And I had sent him letters with scriptures and be bold and courageous, how proud we are. But one of the things I sent to him 
was um, a, a, a passage from Shakespeare. And this passage from Shakespeare is a famous passage um, about, um, it's called the, the Feast of St. Crispin. And it's a, a feast in, in, the, in the story, it's a historical story about Henry V in the Battle of Ajan, where he led a, a small English force against an overwhelming British force. And everyone says, oh man, there's no way we can fight this battle. There's too many of them. And Henry comes up and says, what he that saith so? And he gives this speech. And I had sent it to him because in this speech is an inspiration about the fruit of what is created in us when we struggle well. And some of you may know some of this, but he didn't get it in the letter, so I read it to him on the phone, and I, I, I said it to him on his phone. I could say it, but I get emotional, so I'm just going to read it. it this, is the, this is the speech. It says, This day is called the Feast of Crispian. Those that outlive this day and come safe home will stand tiptoe on this day when this day is named and rouse him at the name of Crispian. He then shall, he that live this day and see old age will yearly on the vigil feast his neighbors and say, tomorrow is St. Crispian. Then he will strip his sleeves and show his scars and say, these wounds I had on Crispin's day. Old men forget, but none will forget and will remember with advantage what feats they did that day. Then our names, familiar as on our mouths as household words, Harry the King, Bedford and Exeter, Warwick and Talbot, Salisbury and Gospel, G Glosker will be on their flowing cups, freshly remembered. This story a good man will tell his son. And Crispin Crispian shall ne'er go by from this day till the end of the world, but we in it shall be remembered. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for whoever fights with me this day shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile. And gentlemen in England will think themselves accursed they were not here and hold their manhood cheap when anyone rises to speak who fought with us upon St. Crispin's Day. And I wanted him to see that in this, that through the struggle, things would come to him that would be of great advantage, that advantage that he would tell his kids, that would form and shape him, that after a day like a day in Winnipeg, not much in this life is going to seem hard after that. And that that's something you can give to others. You can invest in others. And uh, I sent it again, and he got it at another stop. Um, but this was what we had for him, and this is what we wanted to give to him. Now, the summer played out, and it was getting close to the end. Ben was going to finish his trip in Churchill. And uh, the plan was for Whitney and I to drive to Winnipeg, which is eight hours away. And he was going to take, the only way to get back from Churchill is either fly there or take a two and a half ride, day train ride back to Winnipeg. That's the only way to get there. There aren't roads. And so we're getting close. We're going to pick him up in Winnipeg after his train ride. And I said to Whitney one day in the hall over here, I said, wouldn't it be something if we flew up there and met him, just surprised him? And then the next day she had tickets. And so um, <laughs> they were expensive. They were very expensive, those tickets. And... Um, Sure enough, we flew from Winnipeg in this little, you know, into Churchill. This is polar bear country in Wales. It's the most amazing, wonderful place. I really recommend you going there. It's, it's a fascinating place. But we got there just the day he was going to come in. And we went to this part, uh, the, 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 the place he was going to float in. And we we're going to see the end of his, his journey. And there's a bear tower there. So it's this giant steel tower that you run in and lock the door so the polar bears don't eat you. So we were in this. This is the place we're at. And he's in a canoe, you know. Wow. And so, um, so we went and we looked. And so here's Whitney looking for her son. Um, to come home, uh, and then you can see she's looking, and I, I knew the map, and I knew the direction they were coming from, I said, that far point, he's going to come around that far point, and sure enough, he came around, and see him coming, and we hadn't seen him for like 90 days, we hadn't seen him, and so he's, he's rolling in, and he doesn't know we're in the tower, he doesn't know we're going to be here, and so we're in this tower, and taking the video of uh, his last thing, and of course he comes in, and he meets us, here's Whitney and I, and the two guys, and this is Roy, he's the guy who picked us up, he's an Australian, he's married to a British uh, dog sled musher, he's a fascinating guy, musician, we met the most amazing people, but this is them after they arrive, but we're in the tower, and we capture um, them coming in, the very last few paddles of their journey, plus um, just the surprise of them seeing us, so let's go ahead and look at how that played out.
took you guys so long. What? <laughs> oh. Ow! <laughs> That's pretty crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so that was worth the price of the plane ticket for sure. It was a magical week of whales and bears and craziness. Um, but at the end of the day, what it really was um, was just seeing the power of preparation, the power of wise protection, and just a person emerging. And it thought made me think of, you know, our kids are going to go places we can't go. They're like arrows we shoot into places, and that's exactly what we would want. And as they get older, what we can really do with them is love them, support them, but pray for them and trust the God who's going to meet them in the midst of their struggles. And that's why we need you, dads. That's why we need you to engage. That's why we need you to bring adventures. That's why we need you every now and again to push moms a little bit, to carry a pocket knife and crawl on something high and go on an adventure and jump in the water and, and those kinds of things or, or try something or face a bully and, and talk it through how you could do this and do things for them when they're young, but with them when they're not so young, and supporting them when they should be taking on the responsibilities for their own life. This is what dads do. This is the gift of dads. This is why our culture cannot live without dads and the spirit of a dad in every person's life. So whether you're a coach, an uncle, a teacher, that other male in their life, we need the spirits of dads in the most wonderful day way. I want to end my time by just having a word of blessing for the dads. So if you're sitting next to a dad, someone with the heart of a dad, someone who's a coach, someone that's there, an uncle, crazy uncle, put your arm around him right now. Just kind of say, hey, we love you. Way to go. We need you. Just come on. We need you. Way to go. All right? And we're just going to have a word of prayer for all those ones who are dads and have the hearts of a dad, even as the team comes out and leads a perfect song about adventure, meeting God in adventure to close our time. Father, thank you. That when you taught us to pray, your son taught us to pray, he said, when you say pray, say our Father. Because that's hardwired on our heart. And for all those who have pain in that, thank you that you meet us in that pain and you renew and you redeem. Speak comfort for those who are missing a father and honoring them even in their love for them that way. And Father, we would pray for the men in this room who are fathers, who have the heart of the fathers, who coach, who teach, who are there, who stand in that gap. Give them courage. Give them wisdom and discernment. Help them find that right discerning balance between protection and preparation, understanding that the ultimate protection is preparation. We want our sons and daughters to be strong, to be prepared, to manage themselves and control themselves, that they might have the freedom to do all the things you have called them to be. Give us a vision, Father, for family and parenthood as individuals, as a church, as a community. And just renew us, renew our communities by renewing our families, by renewing our fathers and our mothers. We lift everybody up, and particularly fathers, this, this uh, Father's Day. And we do all this in Jesus' name. Amen.